Hello. Am I on? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good better. I've got no energy, so I need to feed off you. Um, for those that were here seven minutes ago and saw me start seven minutes early, then this is the second take. For those that weren't, then this is the first time I'm ever, ever doing this. Um, so my name is Chris Emmett. Um, I am a knocking person. Um, I'm a 22 times certified... Uh, um, oh, sorry, right. Start that again. I will start that again fresh. My name is Chris Emmett. I'm a uh, Salesforce architect for a company called Curry's, which is a UK electronics retailer. And today I'm going to be talking about using Salesforce at scale, AKA how Salesforce makes it really awkward for big orgs. Because they do, they don't make it easy. They'd like to think they do, but they don't. Um, anyone from Salesforce in attendance, apologize, apologies for anything that you're about to hear. Um, before I dig in, I want to actually just introduce you to the company that I'm going to be demonstrating today. And they're called Elite Synergies Limited. They're the world's largest firm, investment firm, and they love to grow through aggressive acquisitions like every investment firm does. And in that, they own a thousand companies. And in those thousand companies, they've got 30 million customers. And with those 30 million customers, they are selling 5,000 products. So it's not a small company. It's a huge company. Big, 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 with lots of complexity, lots of business complexity. They've got lots of business processes. They've got lots of customers that are having to handle and you know, sell to as well. But Salesforce doesn't just cater to these big companies. They cater to the small companies as well. So we've got Barry and Paul's moving company, the world premier moving company in the UK, even though I said world premier. They take stuff, move it from A to B. It's not a big complex company, but they use Salesforce as well. It's not just the big elite synergies, it's also for the small two-man bands. But let's compare the two. My clicker's not working. Um, did they have the same number of customers? Well, Elite Synergy, as we saw, they've got 30 million customers. But Barry and Paul do not have 30 million customers. They've probably got a couple of hundred, maybe a couple of thousand. So they've got different considerations to take into. Did they have the same revenue? Well, one's probably pulling in billions of pounds a year, and the other's Elite Synergies. No. Obviously, there's a big difference in the amount of revenue they're bringing in. Do they have the same business complexity? That's debatable. But you're going to assume that the big investment firm has got more complexity. They've got more business processes. They've got more apex and flows running in their system. Now, this is where the similarities actually collide. Are they using the same infrastructure? Yeah, they might be on the same server. They're using the exact same stuff. And Salesforce gives them the exact same tool sets. For both Elite Synergies and Barry and Paul, they can build out complex data models. They can build out automation with Flow and Apex. And they can integrate with systems outside of Salesforce because no Salesforce implementation is an island on its own. It's connecting with other systems. But it's, do go back, but it's not that simple because Elite Synergies has to be more considerate with how they implement Salesforce. They have to think about how Salesforce is going to creak, how it's going to handle those bigger processes, that bigger data, those bigger implementations. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to take us through these three sections. We're going to go through data, we're going to go through automation and integration and just talk about the considerations that you have to make when you scale up to a large organization within Salesforce. And also, I, I do want to make this interactive. So if you, if you do have questions throughout, just raise your hand and uh, I welcome every question. There will be a section at the end for Q&A as well. So let's kick off with data, complex data considerations. 
Well, first off, if you're dealing with a big company like Elite Synergies, you're not going to be dealing with thousands of records or hundreds of records in your object. You're going to be dealing with millions of records. The company I work for, as I mentioned, uh, Curry's, we've got 30, nearly 30 million customers in our account object. Similar number for orders, similar number for experienced cloud users. It's a big, complex org. So there's lots of data. But Salesforce, while it can technically handle all of that data, it's not going to be performance. So you need to think about how you're going to store that. You need to think about the life cycle of that data. All data has a beginning, middle, and end, like in a good story. And the trick with Salesforce at scale is to make sure that you are not keeping that data for longer than you need. You're creating it. You're creating it for a purpose. You're backing it up if you need to. And then you're deleting it when you are done. And more, more than not, not just to keep the system performant, you might need to delete it to stay compliant. People may want the right to be forgotten. You might need to delete data after a certain retention period. You need to be thinking about how you are offloading that data and keeping the stuff that you need just for the period that you need it. Then you need to make sure that the amount of data that you have is foolproof. You don't want to be storing too many fields in an object, for example, because how are you going to train people to actually fill that in? Because if they're not fully trained properly, you're going to introduce bad data. If you're storing data for the sake of storing it, then you're just going to run into issues because you don't want to store too much data. And by storing too much data, you do run the risk of slowing your system down. So in the two examples I've got here, do you need role hierarchy and do you need formula fields? Role hierarchy in particular is a difficult one. If a person owns more than 10,000 records, you'll actually instigate an issue in Salesforce called data skew, whereby if you update a record and you happen to own 10,000 records, the sharing, the sharing permissions rules will check every single one of your records that you own. And then it will go to your manager because you're in a hierarchy. And then it will check the sharing settings for that person against the 10,000 records, and maybe the other records that he owns, and then up and up and up. And that can slow Salesforce down. Now, there's ways around that. So one of the ways is that you could just do without role hierarchy. Maybe you just don't need it. Maybe you can find other ways of ensuring that data is shared responsibly. And then another one is if a person desperately needs to have 10,000 records and you desperately need to have a role hierarchy, put them at the top of the tree. Because when you sift through 10,000 records and if it checks their manager, if they've not got a manager, you're fine. Now, the next one, I mentioned formula fields. And I know that formula fields can be a fan favorite in some pockets of Salesforce, but when you're dealing with 10,000 records, a million records, formula fields can really slow the system down. Because every time you open up a record with a formula field, Salesforce is actually doing the calculation to figure out what that field's supposed to contain. And if you're trying to export 2 million records with a formula field, three formula fields, five formula fields, Salesforce is going to slow down as it's trying to calculate all of that information. Now, one of the ways you can get around that is by using process automation to stamp a value. Obviously, if it's, if it's based on a date, like you want to know if the record's due today and there's a tick, you can't do that because it requires real-time processing. But if you want to take two values and add them together, well, you could do that as a flow or apex at the point that you're saving that file. So let's, let's look at Elite Synergies. So they've got unlimited edition because, of course, they do. Um, they've just bought a new company called Help Me Now. And they need to integrate Help Me Now into their service org. Now, this merger will result in 700 uh, fields on their case object, just which is really close to their limit, because the limited and unlimited edition is 800 fields. 
Now, can this be maintained and kept compliant? What's the consensus? No. Why? Because it will grow over time and it's unnecessarily complex. So there's a administrative overhead of just managing that many data points at the end of the day. I'll try and repeat that for the people on the stream. I just realized you're not mic'd up. Um, but yeah, it will grow over time. It will be difficult to maintain. And how are you going to train people on that? Which is, bring, actually, bring, you, you've kind of covered the third step, so I'm going to ignore that. But if it is growing over time, and you add in that complexity, how are you even going to migrate that off Salesforce? We'd all like to think that Salesforce is going to be used in a company forever, but there will be a certain point where you need to move that off platform. It might move to something that's not been invented yet. It might move to another version of Salesforce. If you were just saving data, and complexity for the sake of saving that data, you're just adding more complexity to a problem down the line. You're making your migration difficult. And realistically, you want to make that migration as easy as possible. One of my favorite anecdotes with that is if, <laughs> if a company wants to move away from Salesforce or move on to a different system, you saying that it's going to be difficult isn't going to make that problem go away it's just going to make the migration more difficult. So you kind of want to have the data in a position where it's easy to get out and get back in and migrate. So this is the one that you kind of touched on. If you've got 700 fields on the case object that are on that page, who's filling that in? Who is that for? Now, I've, I've, worked in, I've worked in places where there's been 700 fields and 300 fields and on the page, and none of it gets filled. It's, it's there because a business process was dictated that doesn't really have any business being there. And you've really got to fight that. You've really got to get it down because you want to reduce that complexity, reduce the training overhead, improve the data quality, make it easier to get data in and out. And this last one, because every talk's got to have some sort of AI in it this year. So this is my bit of AI. Um, <laughs> AI is built on data, good data. Just like a 60-year-old adage of crap in, crap out with databases. It's not really changed. If you are not storing data of good quality, of meaningful quality, how are you going to train an AI model to learn how your business works? So that is data. So next, I'm going to go on to automation. I'm going to quickly check the time. Um, so automation considerations. And I've mentioned flow here, but you could replace that with Apex. It's not important. Can your automation scale? Can you bulkify it? Now, who, who's familiar with the term bulkify? Who's not familiar with the term bulkify? And this is not to. Oh, great, yeah, yeah, right, so, so Salesforce is a little bit, so Salesforce is on a shared platform, and with that shared platform, you get this thing called governor limits. So these governor limits ensure that everyone has a nice experience. It's all nice and happy. But it does mean that if you've got 30,000 records that you want to update, you can't just say, hey, Salesforce, update these 30,000 records. You've kind of got to put it all together in a big bundle and say, just do this, do this once instead of do this, do this, do this, do this. So bulkification is getting everything together and just saying, do all this once for me. And on these big orgs, you kind of have to do that because you're going to be running lots and lots and lots of automation. You're going to be affecting lots and lots of different records. So are you bulkifying? your automation to make sure that you are not hitting any of these limits. And if you do have automation running 50,000 times a day, how are you ensuring that you're not going to be conflicting with anything? Because you might be trying to affect the same records twice. You might be trying to affect, especially in a role hierarchy, you might be getting record contention because there's two people who's sharing rules are being updated. You need to make sure that your automation can handle that conflict. 
so it can fail gracefully. Which brings me on to my next thing. So at my, uh, at my employer, Curry's, around about 2,000 flows fail every day. There's about 20 million flows that run every month. 2,000 flows every single day fail. So how do you ensure that it can self-recover? How do you ensure that someone is not receiving 2,000 emails a day because that's just noise and you don't really look at it, you're not really addressing the issue? So let's go back to Elite Synergies. So they're using Service Cloud, and as I mentioned at the start, they've got 30 million customers. They've got flow to handle complex case routing process, and that runs five times a second, which is roughly 13 million times a month. And as I said, Curry's has a flow that runs 20 million times a month, so this is actually underselling it. Now, how do we make sure that a poor admin isn't bombarded with 2,000 emails every day? Suggestions? Um, you're not allowed to. All right, so what you can do is effectively just build out as much fail safe into your automation. These automations will fail. It's just how do you capture that? How are you ensuring that it fails gracefully? So if it's trying to update a record but it can't, then put some sort of fault into that, put a decision into that. So you're then sending a nice little error message to the user to say, hey, this is not working, let's try it again or try again later. So you can fail gracefully. Because if the flow fails gracefully, it's going to stop poor admin receiving 2,000 emails a day. Because as I said, that's just noise. And then, how are you giving that user constructive feedback? If this is running, if this flow is running on a community and you've got 25 million community users, how are they going to respond to a flow that's failing? That's difficult. Now, if you've got it, if, if they're end users and you've still got 30,000 end users, how are they going to handle that? Because you don't want them to receive an error message 2,000 times a day and then them contact the admin. It's not manageable. You've got to make sure that you're handling these errors, you're giving meaningful information to these end users. Be it, sorry, this is not working, there's a network issue, this file's not formatted correctly, try again later. You need to deflect the uh, error away from the admin because at that scale, no one can handle that. So now I'm going to go on to integration, which is similar to automation, but just exiting Salesforce. So can it scale? It's exactly the same. Can it scale? Are you bulkifying this stuff? Instead of just hitting an external server 30,000 times, are you getting all of your requests together and just saying, do this once? And because it's an external system, you kind of got to assume that it's entirely out of your power, entirely out of anything that you can do, and it will fail. So similar to automation, how are you handling that failure? Is your entire system completely reliant on an external service being available, and it'll just fall over if not? You can't really do that at that scale. You need to assume that it will break and you need to handle that break. The next one, which is near and dear to my heart in the past few weeks, because it's cropped up. Um, when you've got these big organizations and these big complex integrations, someone is going to be setting up the passwords and the API keys. And sometimes it might be in their inbox. It might be in a notes app. You need to find a responsible way of managing those keys, because Passwords will expire, keys will expire. You will need to regenerate that and you need to do it in a responsible and process-driven way. And then last but not least on this one, what happens if bad data internally to Salesforce causes an issue with an integration? You send an information out to, to a service, but what happens if you send some information that it's not expecting? 
might be in the wrong format. That's going to cause an error, but then you need to handle that error. You need to fail gracefully so the user's not contacting you 2,000 times a day. So back onto Elite Synergies. They've got 15 backend system, which is very light, I, I must admit. And all of these connections are synchronous, which basically means it sends a message out. I can see people shaking their head at that. It sends a message out, and it's waiting for a response. It's, it's, it's basically saying, do this, and then it's waiting. I want to see if I can convince people on the stream that it's broken. Um, <laughs> um, and that, that, that's just a terrible way of doing it. You never want to do synchronous if you can help it. And then the number of these systems don't have the bandwidth to handle high traffic, which basically means if you're spamming these systems, it's going to fall over. So there's two major red flags here. They're relying on synchronous, and basically these systems can't handle the, the traffic. So. A new word here that I've brought up, which is uh, integration pattern. There's multiple ways in which you can integrate with an external system. And the trick isn't to just say, we're going to do it this way. The trick is to define how your integration should happen. Are you going to send a file? Are you going to send a message? Are you going to send a asynchronous message? So you're kind of just dropping off a message and saying, just get back to me whenever. You need to define these different patterns, and then you need to strategize how you're going to deploy them. Because there are some systems where you may need a response that's vital to the process, and that might be synchronous. But then there's another system where you're just kind of finishing stuff off. That can just be a message, an asynchronous message. Just do this whenever. You need to define that, and you need to deploy it, implement it responsibly. Now, in this one, how can Elite ensure that the messages are always delivered? Well, this one is probably a bit of a cop out, but if they use middleware, you can ensure that that queuing system is in place. So if, <laughs> I'll, I'll use MuleSoft as the example, if you send a message from Salesforce to MuleSoft and then MuleSoft tries to reach an external system, if that external system is not available, it can try again and try again and ensure that you've got guaranteed delivery of that message. If you're using point to point, so you're just having Salesforce talk directly to an external system, that message isn't guaranteed to be delivered. It's fired and it's forgotten. So middleware in this, in this, this scale, middleware is really vital to ensure that messages are delivered. And then how do you ensure your applications still up and running when that system's down. And um, one example that we use at Curry's, um, so strange, I said I wasn't going to use Curry's as an example, and now this is the third time. Um, so we, we have a delivery system. Now, if that delivery system is down, we just default, default to a, a default date. So for example, if it's I want to buy a product and Cool, I want it in the next few days. Reaches out to the delivery system. If that delivery system's down and there's no message back, it'll say, cool, we can do it in 10 days. Might change. So by that, we're not stopping the customer from completing that transaction. We're ensuring that that transaction can carry on. We're just kind of using a fail-safe value to make sure that we're not breaking that process. So in summary, I think I'm got 15 minutes left. <laughs> In summary to this, um, there's three different pillars that we've gone over. We've gone over data, we've gone over automation, and we've gone over integration. Now, the big takeaway from data is the bigger you go, the simpler you need to get. You need to really dumb down that data. Get rid of fancy <laughs> hierarchy. Get rid of fancy formulas. Just keep it nice and simple. With the automation, you need to automate your failures. Assume it's going to fail. Assume you need to guide the user through the process of getting back to the point they can carry on with their day and not bombard the admin with thousands of emails. And similarly for integration, 
you need to assume that those external systems are entirely out of your control. You don't have any control of them, so they can go offline whenever they want, and you need to be able to plan for that. You need to be able to handle a system not being available and still have your process work. And then there's a sneaky extra one that I've added that I've not brought up yet, but it is super important. And that is, a lot of this takes control. A lot of this takes supervision. Well, not the word supervision. But by putting in a center of excellence, by defining these standards, by reviewing the code, reviewing the changes, ensuring the strategic direction of Salesforce is in place, you can give it, Salesforce at a scale a fighting chance because you're ensuring that no one's bringing in awkward hierarchies, awkward formulas. You're ensuring that the, the automation and the integrations are following patterns. And you're ensuring that everything to do with Salesforce is under control and driving forward in the right way because there is so much to look at, not just these three things. I mean, th this is just a small sample of the things I could think of. This is all relevant to any center of excellence. They need to think about every single one. And when you're working at scale, it's doubly important. And on that, I think I went very fast. Do we have any questions? Any questions at all? Yes. Yes. I, I, I think, so, yeah, so I will repeat the question. Thank you, Rob. Um, so Max asked, um, what's the most important of these three pillars? I'll try and go back while I talk. What's the most important of these three pillars? Is it data? Is it automation? Is it integration? And I would say that the order in which I've presented this is probably the order that I would say is the important important one, because data makes up the system. Data is the life and breath of Salesforce. So unless you've, not, unless you've got that, and, until you've got that under control, all of the process automation, all of the integration is kind of hanging off that data. I mean, to be fair, all automation and integrations require an input of data, and then it processes that data and then outputs it in some meaningful way. So the, the data for me is, is the most important. Any other questions? Rob? What other techniques are there for handling that kind of volume of data in the sales force? Or what, what other options are available if you have no choice but you have that kind of thing? Things like big objects, external data connections, archiving. You just answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, if you are using a lot of data in Salesforce, like a monumental amount of data in Salesforce, there, there are mean, ways and means of actually easing, and easing the burden. So as Rob mentioned, uh, big objects, external objects. So I'll go over the two very briefly. Uh, a big object is basically a very slimmed down version of a Salesforce object in that there's no FAF, there's no automation, there's no, there's not, I don't think there's even any real reporting on it. It's basically just a very skeleton table that you can access through Apex. Um, I don't believe you can access it through Flow. So you can only access it through Apex, through a SQL query. Um, but because it's so slim, it means that you can really scale that data up. You can have way more data, but you don't get you don't get formulas. You don't get any sort of form of automation with it. It's just a repository for your dumb data. Um, and external objects is a bit better in that you can connect an external data source into Salesforce. It's not cheap, but you can do it, um, and you get all of the you get all of the Salesforce features with it. But Salesforce is not worrying about actually storing that data. You can run your automation off it. I don't believe you can do formula fields, but you can certainly run automation. You can have triggers whenever a new record comes in. It can treat it, by and large, like an internal table. 
but it's off platform, which again eases the burden a little bit. Yep. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, for the for the simple stuff, like I need to take points. Oh, sorry. I will repeat the question. How do you, how do you handle uh, formula fields? Uh, when they're when they're really needed for a traffic light system, for example. So, for formula fields where you are just taking data point A plus data point B, maybe it's a order value plus delivery value. That's that's something that you can use automation to stamp that data. So, if you've got a trigger or a flow that is saving that record, you have the flow, the trigger, the apex calculate that field, and then stamp it. Now, when it comes to traffic light systems or anything that's like, today is the day tick, um, you can't really, you can get around that in a way by using, again, automation to, if, you, if you've got a, a widget that is opening up a record, you can have that widget run that automation for you to determine that traffic light system. If you need it on the record, however, you can, you can still use formula field on a record, but when you're doing data extraction or data reporting, you need to make sure you are not referencing that formula field in any way. Because I, I, believe me, I, I've, done a, I've done an export of about a million records, and it took three hours, and I ended up having to stop because I had four formula fields on there. And I took the four formula fields away. It actually took minutes. Would you say it's a, it's a better approach maybe to develop more AWC for the on-screen experience yeah. that makes it a visual indicator? Yeah, so, um, so when I mentioned earlier about developing a widget, uh, that, that's what I was referring to. So by just using an LWC or a, a screen flow on the page to actually look at that data, determine that formula on the fly and display it. Because what it means is you're not burdening the record with that formula field. And by not burdening it, you're removing the stress from any data extraction, any reporting. Any other questions? Yep. You mentioned a couple of times using flow as a, as a workaround either to stack the records or, or I mean, how do you visualize it? Um, so, flow is very, very, very scalable if you are running 15,000 flows that are all accessing a single record. If you are running 15,000 flows that are accessing 15,000 records, you're going to hit trouble. Even if you just want to run one flow that's trying to handle that amount of data, you're going to run into issues. Flow is really good at scaling at the small kind of jobs. So in the, in the example of a traffic light system, every time someone opens up a record, it's entirely scalable. And as I mentioned, Curry's runs 20 million flows a month. That applause was for that. <laughs> <laughs> Oof, that is an interesting one. One flow per object. <sighs> yeah, flow orchestra. Um, I, I'm old school. I, I like the idea of using the flow to create a traffic light system. That's the second time I mentioned traffic light. To create a traffic light system that would then fire subflows if you want. If you need record triggered flows, so. I would create a single flow in that instance to say, oh, you want to update this record for this reason or that reason. Well, run this flow and then that flow. And then you're able to manage it all. Any other questions? OK. We've got five minutes left. 
I'll do my interpretive dance now then. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. If you've got any questions at all. <laughs>